Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Game to Decom video, we're going to be tackling tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with MAMAR, which is a new technology from Western Digital, which it touts will allow hard drive space to absolutely balloon. Imagine 40 terabytes plus. Phil Spencer also makes some comments, of course, regarding the Xbox One and the Xbox One X saying that the Xbox One X will not be for everyone, and also, once again, criticizes exclusive downloadable content. A small update to the GTX 1070 Ti fiasco, and that's about your lot. But we're going to start things out, as I said, with the hard drive side of things. Now, this is uh, quite an in-depth topic. And to be honest, it's outside the scope of a news video to do a full in-depph analysis, so I'll link uh, Anantech's article in the video description. But I did want to tackle this somewhat because I find this a very interesting topic. So currently, hard drive space is definitely getting bigger. I mean, it wasn't too long ago, at least if you think about it, that one terabyte of space seemed, well, almost endless. You remember that, right? When you or your friend first got a one terabyte hard drive, you maybe upgraded from a 250 gigabyte drive, and you thought, huh, no way am I going to need more than that. Now, of course, 6 terabyte drives, 8 terabyte drives, 10 terabyte drives are on the horizon. And yes, not many people have an 8 terabyte drive, and that, of course, is putting things mildly, but it is what it is. Of course, we also have SSDs and other technology, and those spaces are also getting bigger. 1 terabyte SSDs are not now uncommon, and they are within the realms of affordability for a lot of users. But mechanical drives are not going anywhere. According to Western Digital, their roadmaps tell us that by 2025, we're going to be seeing hard drives of 40 terabytes. Now, these primarily are going to be for the data center. And they will utilize microwave-assisted magnetic recording, MAMA. And as part of this design... There will be a spin torque oscillator, known as an STO if you prefer, capable of creating precise energy fields without overheads. This oscillator will then in turn generate magnetic waves. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say magnetic waves, I meant to say microwaves. And these microwaves will operate at a frequency of between 20 and 40 gigahertz, creating an energy assist and in theory making it easier to write to the bits. And unlike Hamar, one of the benefits of this is that you don't need to produce excess heat, which can, of course, hard drives and heat don't go hand in hand, so therefore you have, with Hamar, degradation of reliability. And with Mamar technology, we should be seeing bit densities go up exponentially. In fact, according to Western Digital, they predict it should scale, at least in theory, more than 4 terabytes per square inch. And this will also be guaranteed with the standard five-year lifetime warranty. Well, lifetime is five years, so it's still pretty damn good. Next topic, and this is the NVIDIA GTX 1070 Ti slash Ti. Now, a couple of folks have messaged me this on Facebook. One, actually, on Facebook. One via email, to be exact. Um, asking my opinions because PC Games N have actually run a article saying that no, NVIDIA will not be restricting the GTX 1070 Ti overclocking. I'm not quite sure what the state of affairs is with this. First of all, it's only a rumour. So the fact that it's only a rumour, technically even the 1070 Ti slash Ti is not uh, confirmed by NVIDIA. But let's face it, we've seen it pop up in the afterburner change logs. We know it's happening, so we can essentially say it's all but, you know, confirmed at this point. But with the overclocking side of things, A, it's not confirmed, as in we don't know whether NVIDIA are really going to be restricting it. B, whether some AIBs are just going to simply break it, although I doubt that, simply because NVIDIA, if they are enforcing it, may be a bit, well, unhappy. And C, is it possible to BIOS mod? But regardless of that... EX Preview um, are citing the fact that you don't actually have large quantities of GDDR5X memory. So, in short, one of the problems NVIDIA are probably facing, and this is both with the 1080 and the 1080 Ti slash Ti, 
They literally just can't produce adequate quantities. Therefore, for them to produce the 1070 Ti, it just makes an awful lot of sense. They can essentially put some of those GP104 cores to use. Now, I don't necessarily like how uh, PC Games N have worded some of that article. This is not a criticism. Everyone can make things a bit odd occasionally. But the fact of the matter is, one of the reasons they're citing is, and it's a pretty good reason, uh, essentially you might just be at the cusp where GDDR5 memory can't be going any faster, but from what the rumours are, it's also the core clocks. But as they rightly point out, no one knows anything at the moment. Don't forget that the rated clock speed as I've mentioned previously, is not necessarily indicative to real-world clock speed. Um, the current clock speed uh, we're hearing, just for your FYI, is 1683 megahertz. This is for boost clock, identical to the 1070. Don't forget, we don't even know 100% if these uh, specifications are accurate. It's possible memory clocks might be faster than 8 GBPS. It's possible it might be 9. One website did report that, but whether that's true or not, I don't know. It's also possible that you can overclock it. After all, with the 1070, there are cards with much faster memory than 8 gigabits per second, so that's certainly something to take under advisement. Honestly, right now, I would not rain hellfire down on NVIDIA. Let's just wait and see what happens. But I figure there's going to be a way of unlocking these cards anyway. So it's just a very small update just for those who have asked me my opinion on that. And a couple of pertinent topics for the Xbox One X because its release date is looming ominously close. Uh, this uh, comes to us from a GameSpot interview at the Brazil Game Show. I'll link, of course, the interview in the video description. Uh, Spencer has said the, the Xbox One X is not designed for the mass, mass market appeal. Whether you've got a 1080p or a 4K television, you're going to have a great experience. But it's not for everyone. It is, of course, referring to the Xbox One X. It's like we built the Xbox One Elite controller, but we didn't say to everyone, hey, you need this extra controller. Go buy the Elite controller. But they did sell a, quote, ton of those controllers. We know the gaming segment, we know there's people who play games casually, and we also know there's people who play games as their number one hobby. To be honest, I kind of agree with Spencer here. I mean, it's like the PS4 Pro. I know a lot of people who are buying the PS4 Pro, and honestly, I would make an argument that if you're buying a new console now that is the PlayStation 4, the PS4 Pro is probably the way to go. The only caveat with that is if you're not really that bothered, you're really penny-pinching and you get a really good deal on a PS4 Slim. I just feel that the extra horsepower that the Pro offers, plus a few of the other features, just makes it a better purchase in the long run. Particularly if you have an older television, and I know this might seem quite contrary to what you might be thinking, but let's say you have an older model 1080p screen, and therefore there's a good chance, or at least some chance, you're going to upgrade to a 4K in the next year or two. After all, 4K prices are not getting higher, let's just be honest. 4K televisions of at least semi-reasonable quality. You can get one for, like, assuming there's, you know, a sale, mm, 350 to 450 pounds, and that's not with, great, uh, with a great deal either. Sometimes you can get much cheaper than that. I've seen, actually, some people pick up a decent 4K screen for, like, £350. Now, yes, that's not to say it's the best quality with, you know, Ultra HDR and all of that stuff, but it's still a pretty damn reasonable screen. And if you have an older 1080p screen, let's say that's four or five years old, a even an entry level or a medium level 4K screen can seem like a revelation. Even if it has basic HDR and all of the other bits and bobs, it looks absolutely astounding, believe me. So I do feel that the PS4 Pro and Xbox One X are probably better buys if you've got the spare cash and you're jumping into the new ecosystem. But I do realise that that's my opinion and I don't tout that as fact. But here's perhaps a more interesting quote, and this regards the exclusive DLC practices. Now, he does admit that it's quite ironic with this statement, and yes, I grant you that Microsoft have to be a bit careful when they're throwing uh, stones because, well, they've, yeah, you, you know what I'm saying. But uh, people always knock me on this. 
I've gone on the record and I don't love the idea or practice of us paying so other platforms can't use a certain gun in a game or a certain level. Um, he says, I know I say that in Xbox history, DLC exclusivity, Windows with uh, Call of Duty, I understand the fingers are pointing right back to Microsoft. I could be the only, I can only be who I am. It's not the best PR answer, but I just don't like that. Now, I admit that that quote is quite short, and you might think to yourself, well, it's not very genuine of Spencer, but to be fair to him, I kind of agree. I mean, look, I'm not someone who dislikes exclusives, and I know some people hate exclusives, but I don't. Let's just be totally honest with ourselves. Let's just say that every game available right now with the exception of some PC games, let's say every console game available right now was out on the Xbox One. It doesn't matter. You can say the PlayStation 4, you can say the Switch, whatever. Let's just say there was no exclusives. You know this argument as well as I do. No one would buy every one of the free consoles. You're not going to just rush out and say, well, gee, I want to buy an Xbox One and a Nintendo Switch just because I love the company. When you could still play Mario on your PlayStation 4, when you could still play... Uh, um, Gears of War and all these other games on your PlayStation 4. You just wouldn't do it. Exclusives are, well, there. I, I don't really like the idea of timed exclusives. Now, that's one thing I will grant you that I feel he should address. Timed exclusives to me kind of suck. Um, and I honestly feel, this is my opinion, once again, you're probably going to get pissed off with it, but hey, it is what it is. I think that Microsoft should have the thrown the cash down and made sure that Rise of the Tomb Raider, um, Player Unknown, Battlegrounds, they should have just coughed up the money. And I know it would have been an exorbitant amount of money. Maybe that's so for Rise, but they should have just coughed up the money and made sure that those games were exclusive. Exclusive to the Xbox or Windows PC. Now, yes, I grant you, the companies producing those games would have probably lost out on some sales, so yes, that's why Microsoft would have had to cough up an exorbitant amount of fee, or helped do the porting slash development, whatever they had to do, but to me, it's much better. I think the timed exclusive, to be honest, just feel like a cop-out, and honestly, they just cost money for the publishers. I will say, they can have their place, uh, and I don't mean this in a, a positive way for gamers, I mean boosting your lineup in the short term, but I do want uh, Microsoft to really get their ass in gear when it comes to first party exclusives and it's not a new you know, this is not a new uh, this is not a new stance of mine I think most people would agree it's very hard to say well the Xbox One is a better machine than the Playstation 4 but then to be honest, Sony's lineup has had a numerous delays, I mean there are rumours that for example The Last of Us 2 is not coming out until 2019 we've seen some other games slip as well and it's just been a bit crazy. But with the exclusive DLC stuff, to me, <coughs> excuse me, to me it's just absolutely ludicrous. Like, the fact that Destiny has only just had its last expansion available on the Xbox One is just pathetic to me. It's like, dude, who the hell is going to buy that, 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 that DLC? Like, you might get some who really love Destiny 1, don't like Destiny 2. Although, to be fair, it's I don't see why you'd do that. Or maybe you've owned an Xbox One and you just want to see the last bit just to, just to finish it off. But generally speaking, what they should have done, and obviously there was exclusivity causes there, so I'm not necessarily saying that it was Bungie's or whomever's fault. Well, it was their fault in that they agreed to it. But I'm not saying that you know they could have done anything about it. If they'd have released that DLC three months before the release of Destiny 2, then yeah, that would have made some sense. But it's just, I know the game industry is really messy at the moment, and obviously, I, I just don't like it, to be really honest with you. And having these 30 days exclusivity things, or having this gun available on this version, or and it pisses me off even more as a PC gamer, because it's like you're getting it from each end. To be totally honest, and it, it just really annoys me that you have like a small section of game that's just cordoned off, 
uh, for example, uh, Batman, I believe it was Arkham Asylum. This is going back a bit. But the PlayStation 3 version had a few additional missions which were essentially Joker orientated. Now those, ironically, were also available on the Mac version. Now, you could actually play those on the PC if you basically did some stuff to unlock it. You can Google that yourself. I'm not going to uh, go through the whole process. And uh, to be honest with you, the DLC or the additional missions weren't that great, but that's not the point. I just kind of don't like it. I do understand, however, that in some cases, the studio pay... Uh, the Microsoft or whomever do pay additional cash, which I guess you could say it pays for that. But it's just really messy. Now... This is this is a very kind of off the cuff video part of the video just for your FYI, but I remember back in the day of like the Mega Drive and the SNES, there were so many exclusives, and you could quite conceivably have owned a Genesis, never have played any of the Super Nintendo games, but you would have wanted to play them so bad, but you just could not convince your parents to buy both consoles. It was just, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. But you always felt like your system was still awesome. I never felt, even though I was a 16-bit uh, Sega owner, I never felt like, oh, goodness, like the, the Super Nintendo sucks. It has no games. There were awesome games across both platforms. So I do think exclusives are definitely important, and I do want uh, both studios, uh, sorry, both Microsoft Nintendo as well, but to be fair, Nintendo have the exclusive thing quite well down at the moment. So Microsoft, Nintendo, and Sony offer their exclusives. But when it comes to DLC, um, I, I don't like it at all. And this whole 30-day process, and I don't really also, to be honest, like the timed exclusives when it comes to games. But that's just my opinion. I'm not saying it's right. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed this kind of a mishmash video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.